You're Batman. I was Batman. These videos are not for children. If you are a children, then piss off. Hey there, it's me, your least favorite YouTuber, V Infuso. And today, I'm here to talk about a show that should be celebrated a little bit beyond what it is now. That show being Batman Beyond. I've talked in passing about Batman the Animated Series here on this channel. Quite a lot, actually. I've never made a video on that series itself, but it, it comes into play in a lot of the other videos I've made. I've referred to it as the Batman Bible and the Holy Grail of Batman, and to many, it is those things. It's what a lot of people, especially those who grew up in the 90s, consider to be the definitive version of Batman and the characters who inhabit his world. It is probably the most gushed about Batman series, and for good reason. For most Batman fans, Kevin Conroy is Batman. Mark Hamill is the Joker. So to call this show iconic and legendary would be a complete understatement. This show will not be forgotten. This is the Batman show that every other Batman show, movie, or hell, even for some comic books, have to try to match up to. So now just imagine that you're the one tasked with coming up with a sequel to all of that. You now have to try to follow up a beloved instant classic, and that's high risk. I mean, even if you were involved with the original series, that's still pretty huge. If that's not enough of a risk for you, imagine that you're now doing a sequel to the most beloved Batman show of all time, with the most beloved Batman of all time, but now you're creating and crowning his successor. I think it's pretty safe to say that you'd be sweating Batarangs. Now, upon researching the show, I've read claims that Bruce Wayne is actually in his 80s during the series run, but I've also read that the show takes place about 20 years after Batman the Animated Series, so that would make Bruce 60 during the show's original run, and, and just no, no, that's, no, untrue. I'm, I'm not trying to imagine that this is some jacked up old man over here. All right, I already got Vince McMahon haunting my nightmares. No, no thank you. I don't need any more. Uh, uh not happening. So, uh, so, some, some wires got crossed here. So, some information isn't accurate, but that's what I've gathered. So, let's just say that this show takes place in the future. You know, you know, some stuff has changed. Gotham City, now more than ever, it's crime-ridden. With the street gang that goes by the name of the Jokers who idolize and act in the name of the Joker. I like what they did there. It was very clever. I, I don't know if you noticed it, but they took the villain's name and then they added an S. Oh, I'm sorry. No, a Z. A Z at the end of it. So now, now, it's, now, now it's different. It's paying homage to them. I understand if you don't get it. It's, it's very subtle. We're so far in the future that your favorite villains and heroes are mostly gone and go unmentioned. The men and women behind those masks have wrinkles and arthritis now. This city desperately needs new blood in its hero veins. And that's where Terry McGinnis comes in. Now, when creating the next Batman, a safe bet would be to have the mantle transferred over to another established character. And with Batman, there's a lot. Going just by the animated series continuity here, there's Robin, Batgirl, Nightwing, or hell, maybe you want to go balls out and anoint the Creeper as the next Cape Crusader. I don't know, I, I wouldn't do it, but it's a choice. I'm just trying to say you have options. Alternatively, maybe you'd create a brand new character using the old Batman blueprint. You know, bring in some new, uh, deep-thinking, tactical, stoic brute who has an affinity or trauma related to bats. I mean, why not? They recycled the same Robin design about three or four times over and called it a new character each time, so if it works, you know, stick with it. You want to try something new? Go for it. Just make sure it's new and name only. But no, that's not what the series did at all. Because Batman's successor here couldn't be any more different from Gotham's favorite playboy. Terry McGinnis was no Bruce Wayne. And that's why I loved him. Terry McGinnis here is depicted as a young, occasionally naive punk with an attitude problem. He's a snarky asshole who is just as likely to take down the criminals he encounters psychologically as he is physically which is the polar opposite of what Bruce would have done. Bruce didn't really engage with his enemies like that. He didn't trade barbs. I mean, who is this guy, Spider-Man? Are you in or are you out? It's you who's out, Gobby. Out of your mind. But Terry did. Terry could verbally spar with the best of them. Do you know too many people who could play mind games with the clown prince of crime? No, I didn't think so. He plays rough, he fights dirty, this guy is nothing like the Batman who came before him. And in a way, 
I think that's why I like him as Batman's successor so much. He's not just a copy and paste of the predecessor. He's an entirely new thing. While ultimately it's revealed that the two have a bit in common, I think it's very evident that they have much more in contrast. They're more different than they are alike. I think it's fair to say that Terry has a lot more in common with Jason Todd than he does Bruce Wayne. Yet, it's this difference that makes Terry such a great Batman. Like his mentor before him, who's trained in various fighting styles and combined them together to create his own, Terry kind of does the same utilizing Bruce's trainings, but also never forgetting what he learned on the streets. Oh yeah, prior to becoming Batman, Terry was a self-admitted bad kid who ran around in gangs. So him donning the cowl here is almost a redemption arc. The suit Terry wears also works as a body armor utility belt, supplying him with all kinds of extensions to the suit that work as gadgets, and basically give him superpowers. I, I mean, granted, it's actually the suit, but... Gifted with constant flight and invisibility, this is basically the technological cousin of superpowers. And while yes, Bruce designed the suit, it's still significantly different from anything Bruce did in the animated series. And it overall helps Terry stand out a bit more from his predecessor Shadow. Simply put, Terry is his own Batman. But he's not entirely alone in fighting the good fight, as the OG Batman is only a Bluetooth call away. Following his retirement, Bruce became a complete recluse, becoming the ghost haunting Wayne Manor. Plenty of ghosts in this place. The man was a shell of his former self. Batman became bitter old man until he met Terry. Uh, no, well, I mean, actually, he was still kind of bitter and definitely still old after he met Terry. But now he was a bitter old man with a purpose. Bruce speaks to and guides Terry through his missions, utilizing the suit, basically taking on a role similar to Oracle in the comics. And it works really well here. The completely conflicting personalities of Bruce and Terry really drives the show for me. Their interactions are a meeting of old and new mentalities. Their differing ways of approaching the job makes for an interesting watch. Often Bruce, the experienced vet, is shown to be in the right, but there's also plenty of other times where Terry's alternative method gets the job done better. With a focus still being put on Bruce as well as him guiding Terry through his missions, I could see how it could come off that Bruce is ultimately still the brain while Terry's just the body. You know, this, this new Batman is nothing more than an errand boy. But the show does a good job of both highlighting the importance of the mentorship and establishing Terry's independence from the White and Grey Knight. I said before that the show kind of made Bruce the uh, surrogate Oracle character, but that doesn't mean the show forgot about the actual Oracle, Barbara Gordon. As opposed to being brutalized at the hands of the Joker and becoming the sisterly big brother of Gotham City, Barbara Gordon continues to pursue justice just as her father before her did. That's right. Here, Barbara Gordon becomes the second Commissioner Gordon. And I think that this is just the perfect placement for her. Well, I actually, I think that the Oracle role was the perfect place for her. But this? This is a fine second place trophy. To me, it's really believable that Barbara would follow in her father's footsteps and get into law enforcement because Barbara was probably the most passionate about crime fighting in all of the Bat family. Right behind Bruce. I mean, don't get me wrong. Every one of Batman's sidekicks seemed like they were dedicated to doing the right thing. But for Bruce and Barbara, it always felt like their sole reason for existing. Like there was nothing beyond this. There was fighting the good fight and then waking up to do the same exact thing each and every day. Which I can relate to because that's, that's my life as a YouTuber. So I have no problem believing that after all these years, they're both still heavily involved with the crime cleanup in Gotham City. Even if it's separately, and done through different means now. It's very, very believable. The show also managed to do the unthinkable, when they made Golden Age goofs seem somewhat credible. Ace the Bat Hound showed up in DC Comics way back when, when comic books were much more campy and family friendly and geared exclusively toward children. He was the Bat family's family dog. The pooch who would help out the dynamic duo and solve crimes all while wearing a bat suit of his very own. It's cute and all, but I don't think the pup would actually make his way into the Tim Burton movies. You know, somehow Ace the Bat Hound was left out of the Dark Knight trilogy. But here, Ace is reimagined as a guard dog for an elderly Bruce. And let me tell you something. Ace is as much of a character as anyone else in the series. I mean it, there are some truly, truly heartbreaking moments with this mangy mutt. 
There's a lot to love about this show. The fight scenes and action are really well done, and it seems like there's more of a spotlight put on that than there was in the previous animated series. The show also seems to handle its material very reasonably, never being afraid to dive into darker plots and more mature themes, but still also being accessible to a younger audience. There's some shocking twists and turns that I think might have been even a little bit too dark for the original show's run. There's conflicts that don't necessarily have a clear right and wrong, stories that involve not good or bad people, but people with conflicting ideologies. If I had one complaint about the show, it's that they established an awesome new lead, a brand new Batman, but they never successfully found him a proper arch nemesis. Whereas Batman has one of the best rogues galleries, Batman Beyond has one of the most forgettable ones. I mean, sure, he had reoccurring enemies, but it just felt like there was no... Joker to this Batman. So it shouldn't be surprising that when the decision was made to make a Batman Beyond movie, they decided to bring back the old Joker to face the new Batman. And it was almost a necessity because I can't really see people flocking to movie theaters to see Batman Beyond Return of Nux. The show managed to create such an interesting Batman. It's really unfortunate that they could never make a villain that could stand up to him. And that's also probably why I think some of the strongest episodes of Batman Beyond were the ones with older Batman villains attached. Outside of the Joker and a brief glimpse of Grandma Harley, Mr. Freeze and Bane make an appearance on the show. Not together. And it's nice to have some form of closure to their stories and know what they went through. But they're also not happy endings. Actually, come to think of it, no one gets a happy ending in Batman Beyond. Bruce is bitter. Tim Drake is despondent with crime fighting. Dick Grayson is so disillusioned with Bruce that the series only mentions him once or twice in passing, and they never show him ever again. But to be fair, that kind of fits right in with how little he was used in the new Batman Adventures. I think this show is a great follow-up, and still to this day, after the various attempts of having other characters take over the mantle, I still think Terry may be my favorite successor to his surrogate father. Though, with that being said, there are certain parts of the continuity that I choose not to acknowledge. If you don't want a deeply upsetting spoiler, I'd suggest skipping a couple minutes ahead, because... It's bad. It's so bad. There's blood everywhere. A terrible idea! Why did you let us do that? It's so bad! <sighs> Here we go. Eventually on Justice League Unlimited, it was revealed that Terry and Bruce's meeting wasn't necessarily by chance. It was predetermined. The whole thing was set up by an aged Amanda Waller who, get this, reprogrammed Terry's father's DNA to perfectly match Bruce's, thus making him Bruce Wayne's son, and making him a new Batman for a new generation. And that's a great story. I absolutely hate it. I don't often bring this up, because this to me threw away a lot of what I loved about Batman Beyond to begin with. I don't like the concept of family lineage when it comes to the Batman role. Actually, I don't like that when it comes to most roles. I always enjoyed the concept that anybody could be Batman. Because Batman, all things considered, is just a man. He wasn't born with some kind of superpowers, he wasn't an alien sent to Earth to protect the planet and live their lineage. He was a dude. He's a dude who went through a lot of stress, a lot of trauma in his life, felt a lot of heartbreak, and had a lot of money that allowed him to channel that heartbreak into becoming a giant armored fucking bat. You know, Standard stuff, guys. Just a dude. Terry was also just a man in the making. A troubled boy with potential, taking over a role completely foreign to him. But now, it some predetermined, premeditated destiny? Terry was literally born to be Batman now. Thus basically insinuating that only Bruce, or Bruce's offspring, can be Batman. It makes the story so much less interesting knowing that the characters are basically chess pieces that fell into place. Introducing Destiny removes chance and choice in the process. It makes his journey feel a lot cheaper. 
all those trainings were worthless because he was born to be Batman. He had the Batman gene. This Batman managing to become his own Batman and taking down the Joker? Ah, that doesn't mean anything anymore. Batman took down the Joker all the time. Why wouldn't Batman 2.0 do the same? It's no longer him doing something on his own merit. He was born Batman. Are you seeing what I'm saying here? It kind of robs the character of all of his accomplishments because he was already essentially a Bruce Wayne clone. It also disregards the unique traits and differences that Terry had from Bruce. Because ultimately, uh, he's just B-squared. I hate this change to the story, and it's one of the few things, the very, very few things in the world of the DCAU I've never fully been able to accept as canon. Like, I know obviously it is, but y you will never convince me that it is. Logically, you're right, but mentally, you're wrong, and, and if you bring it up again, we're gonna fight. I don't know how any of you feel about this. Feel free to let me know. I actually do read my comments, mostly. But in my eyes, this was a very disappointing development. Batman Beyond was so great because it was a sequel series that treated its new characters and older characters with the same amount of respect. There was something for a younger audience and there was something for an older audience who previously grew up with the show's original run. If for some odd reason you haven't seen Batman Beyond, then it's beyond time to start watching Batman. It's a proper follow-up to the animated series, but I think even if you haven't seen that show, which again, I'm uh, insane that you haven't. Even if you haven't seen that show, you can still start here and find plenty to enjoy in this. If you guys would like to hear me talk more about Batman Beyond, don't forget to like the video, click that big red subscribe button, and end your comment with, to infinity, and Batman Beyond. Now you may be saying to yourself, V, isn't that unnecessarily corny? Who, who the hell are we trying to impress? We're sitting around talking about Batman. I don't have anybody to look cool for. Anyway, with that being said, I was your least favorite YouTuber, V Infuso, and I thank you for watching. Hope to see you in the next one. I am vengeance. I am the knight. And that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole, and you too would like to become a V-generate, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one bad day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs> Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel.